my name is Luke McMullen, and I'm a PhD student at New York University. I work on the history of philology from roughly the 18th century until the early 20th, uh, particularly philology in the sense of knowledge before I think of philology in the sense of the study of languages. Um, so that bears a lot of relation to what I'm going to talk about today, because one of the questions that I ask in my research is what is the connection between philology in that broader sense and the sciences as they develop in a 19th century university, particularly in Germany and in England as well. Uh, but the two poets I'm going to talk about today are Thomas Percy, who was an 18th century ballad collector, uh, poet and uh, bishop, and David Jones, who's a 20th century, um, I guess you could say very high modernist, uh, Anglo-Welsh poet, uh, living in London most of his life, and published a book called The Anathemata in 1952. And if you haven't read The Anathemata before, uh, the best and probably most clear way of describing what it's like is that it's a little bit like uh, Canto's fan fiction. Uh, but what he's, what he's trying to do is to create a sense of sacramental out of uh, what he would think of as Western archaeology. Okay. So both Thomas Percy and David Jones wrote in what I'm going to call the genre of archaeological poetry. And the purpose of this paper is to give a flavour of that, uh, what I think is a long extant but under-recognised trans-historical genre. Uh, so I'm going to discuss the particular modes in which archaeology enters the poetic practices of both writers and show how genre theory can help us to understand long traditions such as archaeological poetry, the more often I say it the more real it is, uh, that exceed the normal period boundaries within literary studies. So in doing this, I'm taking particular inspiration from Ted Underwood's book, Why Literary Periods Mattered, um, especially his account of the trans-historical character of comparative literature in the United States before World War II, so before René Wellek and people like that come in, and also taking inspiration from Y.G. Dimmock's account of epic poetry, uh, in which, owing to epic's kind of generic predilection for um, archaism, uh, in Dimmock's words, the lexical axis of epic also becomes a temporal axis. In other words, the, the, the wide use of foreign and archaic words adds something uh, temporal to the texture of the, the poetry. So uh, in a sense, it's a kind of display of uh, linguistic strata that we see in epic. Uh, a similar operation takes place within the archaeological poetry I'm going to discuss here. Okay. So and before I go on, any analysis of a temporally long genre such as this has to register the different, uh, what uh, a teacher of mine calls landscapes of genre that exist at the given times. So archaeological poetry is not going to mean the same thing in both Percy and Jones, because the concept of archaeology doesn't mean the same thing uh, to these writers, and neither in fact did the concept of poetry, because they're existing in a wildly different context. Nonetheless, there are things we can do. But what this means is that the meaning of a genre at a given time has to be understood as embedded in a set of both diachronic and synchronic relationships with other genres. So as such, in formulating the mixed genre of archaeological poetry, one would need to take account of the processual and historical natures of both poetry and archaeology, as empirical and historical genres in both periods, as well as to consider them in relation to genres that are conceptually adjacent, so poetry in the novel, for example, or archaeology, philology, and antiquarianism, all slightly different things. So for instance, Percy produced uh, this book called Relics of Ancient English Poetry, which is a three-volume collection of ballads and songs, historical ballads and songs, published in the 1760s, well before the modern concept of archaeology can even be said to have existed. At that time, the term archaeology just meant any writing about the past, usually the ancient past, as well as the entirety of the past itself. So the semantics of the term archaeology then are a lot like the semantics of our modern sense of history, in which history can mean both writing about the past and the past itself as well. So it's both the past and the discourse on the past. Archaeology is similar in Percy's day. So the activity in Percy's time, which looks most like modern archaeology to us, was antiquarianism, which was the recovery and sometimes the often haphazard organization of ancient artifacts and monuments or remains. David Jones, on the other hand, was writing within a context in which the established sense of archaeology today, at least my lay understanding of it, the digging up and analysis of ancient remains, was pretty much already developed. While in his memoir of the Great War, 
which is called In Parenthesis, Digging, Delving, and the Recovery of Ancient Voices, feature heavily. It is his anathemata of 1952 in which I am most interested today. Multilingual, multitemporal, and determinedly epic, the anathemata is also replete with archaeological detail and allusion, especially in its focus in its last section on the now subterranean River Fleet in London, that's where we have Fleet Street. Uh, Jones aims to rewrite the long history of the fleet, and his poetics functions as a kind of archaeological delving, bringing the river back to the surface once more. Percy was writing during a heyday for collections like Relics of Ancient English Poetry. Ballad and song collection were very much in vogue as a kind of literary antiquarianism involving different kinds of historical sequencing and narrativizing of materials. This kind of collection was a massive part, and you really can't underestimate it, a massive part of the literary landscape of Great Britain during the second half of the 18th century. Just three years before the publication of the first volume of his Relics, Thomas Macpherson had published fragments of ancient poetry collected in the highlands of Scotland. In 1770, David Dalrymple and Lord Hales would come out with Ancient Scottish Poems. John Pinkerton published in 1786 a book called Ancient Scottish Poems, never before in print, etc., etc. So there's a group of texts around at the time which look like relics uh, and which form one genre in which relics can be said to take part. I would say that each of these texts also participates in the genre of archaeological poetry as I'm describing it today. But wait, okay, what if we can't find contemporaneous accounts of writers labeling these volumes as archaeological poetry? I'm just making it up. Does that mean that the genre doesn't exist, or that to assert its existence is ahistorical, anachronistic, and therefore a crime? Not really. The point of genre theory is that it gives us a way into charting how knowledge is, in the words of Jonathan Culler, acquired and accumulated. And it is crucial to recognize that types of activity, kinds of acti human activity, which is a basic description of what a genre is, can go unrecognized by people undertaking those activities and their contemporaries. In other words, it's crucial to genre theory that people can be wrong about genres. All these books were accompanied by footnotes and extensive prefatory material in which the fragments assembled, the remains recovered, were explained in terms of their archaeological significance and what they demonstrated about, for example, the origins of the Scots language, the, classi the classical, i.e. the quasi-Hellenic, simplicity of the ancient highlands and its life, or in Percy's case, the transition within the production of poetry in the English and Scottish borders region from a bardic model to one of minstrelsy. He also presents a theory of ancient poetry that ties its worth to its artlessness and naturalness rather than its artfulness and contrivance, in, in which the works are not, quote, labors of art, but effusions of nature. The logic for his assemblage is that, quote, such specimens of ancient poetry have been selected as either show the gradation of our language, exhibit the progress of popular opinions, display the peculiar manners and customs of former ages, or throw light on our earlier classical poets, end quote. In Percy's hands, these specimens acquire evidentiary capacity. In other words, he treats these things as evidence. Their status as effusions of nature for him, rather than artful contrivances, is a prerequisite for this. This, of course, is not, I understand, how antiquities are read today, but it's, it's important for Percy in his time that he's able to make this claim. Now, the literary historian, sort of returning to relics again, the literary historian Barbara Benedict has written about the seemingly paradoxical ordering effect of such anthology collections. She says, even while anthologies advertise difference between the materials contained in them, they paradoxically assert similarity. Because of their cooperative means of production and multiple authorship, anthologies are material expressions of a kind of community, and their format also directs readers to understand them as vessels of a common enterprise." End quote. Percy arranges multi-epochal literary artifacts, so dating back to medieval times, within a generic framework, the anthology, that implies commonality. Uh, and you know, it's remarkable for me that this foreshadows or resembles the kind of proto-archaeological innovation made by Kristen Jogensen Thompson in the 1820s when he arranged you know, the artifacts housed at the future National Museum of Denmark into the three ages of stone, bronze, and iron. Uh, likewise, Percy uses features of the poems in his collection, i.e. what he identifies as their modes of production, in order to assign them to three modes or ages of poetic production, bardic, minstrel, and poetic. Uh, 
Uh, Percy's relics of ancient English poetry and Jones's anathemata are both part recovery of the past and part reconstruction of it. In both works, the material or the matter of history is delved into and made to surface in and from the text. They are archaeology and poetry and poetry in archaeology. And Jones is very specific about that in his preface to the anathemata when he draws on the German historiographical concept of reali. As he says, though linguistically English monoglot accurately describes the writer, certain words, terms, and occasionally phrases from the Welsh and Latin languages, and a great many concepts and motifs of Welsh and Romanic provenance, have become part of, part of the writer's reali within a kind of cockney setting. End quote. Reali means two things. Firstly, the raw materials of knowledge production, those artifacts and materials which are ineluctably so prior to discourse, the things you find and then you have to write about. Secondly, reali means concepts which are culturally specific and therefore resistant to translation. And in English language translation theory, we often call these realia instead of reali. Uh, these two meanings of reali play themselves out in opposition over and over throughout the anathemata. And despite its insistence on the materially prior, the word realien is always used in plural. So even though it denotes a kind of resistant specificity, uh, it nonetheless always summons a class of objects that are, in their multivariate difference, conceptually similar, much like the materials of Percy's anthology or the objects in Thompson's museum. It is not so much that this trans-historical parallel is meaningful in itself, the similarity, or at least I'm less interested here in that quite straightforward point. What needs interpretation is, in Frederick Jameson's words, the historical necessity for this very peculiar and complex textual structure or reading operation itself. In other words, it doesn't matter that Ulysses looks like Ulysses. What matters is, why does Ulysses look like Ulysses at the particular time that Joyce is writing it? Right, so it's not that Percy and Jones are both thoroughly archaeological in their poetics, although that is true, but what conditions enable, encourage, or determine that constellation? This is the sort of question that can bridge a genre theory with inquiry into the changing shapes of knowledge. Jones, for example, folds the ancient Dorian invasion of Greece with its Spenglerian, Oswald Spengler, uh, meaning at that time of barbaric vigor rejuvenating a culture in decline into his own perception of the Nazi invasion of Europe. Uh, to quote, it is 1,200 years since the Dorian Jarls rolled up the map of Arcady and the transmontane storm groups fractured the archaic pattern. And quote, for Jarls read Nordicist racial fantasy, for storm groups read Sturmgruppen. Then he talks about strife years, which is a likely anglicization of the, Ger of the German term Krisenjahre, which is used at the early years of the Weimar Republic immediately following the First World War. What this parallel suggests, at least within how I would read Jones here, is the conquering of a mythic vagueness, Arcady, by the historical specificity, uh, either the Nazis in Greece or the uh, Dorians uh, coming down into Attica. Uh, conquering of mythic vagueness by historical specificity, enabled by the deployment of Jones's reality, by the tension within this concept. Then, in the Lady of the Pool section, which is arguably the poem's most formally open, uh, we begin with a question. Quote, did he meet Lut at the fleet gate? Did he count the top trees in the anchored forest of Lefelis under the White Mount? End quote. And as the nameless, perhaps archetypal Argonaut, whose journey the poem describes, enters the city of London aboard ship, he might have heard, quote, <coughs> seemingly entombed in East Saxon nasal, in other words, in Essex nasal, the cry of the lavender seller. And it's, who'll try my sweet prime lavendula? I cry my introit in a dirigé time. Come by for summer's weeds, thranotic stalks, for in James Ditch, Jack shall soon white his earliest rhyme. End quote. And here the mariner encounters evidence of the successive languages that preceded him. The Latinate prime and Latin lavendula, introit and dirigé, the Greek threnodic or death song, a close equivalent to the dirige of the foregoing line, closely followed by the pun white his earliest rhyme, R-I-M-E, rather than R-H-Y-M-E, uh, in tuning right his earliest rhyme, that's sound rhyme, in which rhyme 
is an uncommon word for frost originating in Old English Hrim. One can read the rhyme, the frost rhyme, as a linguistic rhyme, as that is, after all, what is happening between Dirige and Threnodic. They mean basically the same thing. This must be the Cockney setting for the linguistic reali, and the implication is that the geomorphic specificity of London, its position on an island and its access to the fleet tidal river, makes it an ideal dig site for archaeological English. We should take the unearthing of the subterranean river fleet, a sounding of locale, as an emblem of Jones's archaeological poetics that nonetheless looks very different to what Percy is doing, even though it can be said to take part in the same genre. Tracking the intersections between genres of human activity, in this case poetry and archaeology, offers ways of identifying and learning about how people produce and relate to knowledge. Additionally, such hybrid genre works have periods in which they are more prominent than at others. So modernism was mentioned earlier, but also the 18th century British uh, poetic context, British literary context. Uh, and these prominences, these historical prominences, point to interesting areas for questions about changes in the shape of knowledge. In other words, why then? Why that? Why, for example, does high modernist poetry seem to be such a field of prominence for what I'm calling here archaeological poetry? And why is this also the case in the second half of the 18th century? Are there commonalities of condition to be identified? And if so, what are they and where might they be?